My name is Jean Sparrow, and I have spent almost 35 years in radio and television. It feels weird saying that out loud, but it is the truth. And I'm on a new adventure. I have been sharing uh, what I've learned along the way about success in life. And I believe the biggest source of our success is from the value that we bring to others when we are able to express our truest, most authentic version of who we really are and the gift it is to other people. And it's something I call fearless authenticity. I started this podcast to have conversations with people from all walks of life to see what that looks like, to see what it feels like and what happens when we find and follow our passions, chase our dreams and how that serves other people. Now we're going to talk about it all in this podcast. I wanted to get real honest and open about everything, the ups and the downs, the failures and the triumphs, the distractions and the doubts and everything in between. It's about how we find ways to move forward, to push through, to make our dreams come true and to engage with the world in the way that we were created to do so. So I hope it gets deep because that's where we find all the good stuff, but don't get it twisted. This is about the fun of life because if it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing. So get ready to live as big as you dare and be brave, be free, and be you. Let's learn how to do it together. Welcome to Fearless Authenticity with Jean Sparrow. Now today, my guest is one of my favorite, favorite people to work and laugh with. He is a comedian, an actor, a writer, an author, and host. He is working on his fourth comedy uh, special. He is the president, the new president of the Laugh Factory. He is a Saturday Night Live alum. You've seen him in movies and sitcoms. You've probably listened to his fabulous podcast, Understand This, or got an amazing relationship advice from his column he used to write for Essence Magazine or his book, Your Girlfriends Only Know So Much, a brother's take on dating and mating for sisters. I met him when he used to come to our studio for our television show uh, to promote his stand-up. He was the best guest and even a better guest host, which I think a lot of people agree because he's been filling in on Wendy Williams' show uh, during her time off. He is a native of Atlanta. He's a University of Miami alum. He is a certified pretty boy as a distinguished member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. He is a proud husband to Audrey's and I wait, Adris. I, I always mess up her name. Don't tell her I messed up her name. Adris, an amazing girl dad to Elle and Eva. It is my honor and my pleasure to bring to the stage of fearless authenticity the one, the only finesse, Mitchell. Hey, brother, how you doing? Hello, my sister. Was that a good introduction? That was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. And I think I've said it before, but if you don't give Lena Horn at 18 her face back. You better stop it with this <laughs> beautiful Claire Huxtable, Debbie Allen, Lena Horn, Josephine Baker all rolled up into one. What? Stop Thank you, it. baby. Thank you, baby. I mean, and when you are married <laughs> to a woman as gorgeous as a Dries, I, I take that as a compliment, my brother. How you doing? Let me tell you something. It, it, it really work out when you knock them up first and then you trap them. <laughs> they, all, <laughs> they all have a choice because you want to be legitimate. Okay. Uh, my better half has been uh, with me through the downs and the ups and the downs and, and we back up again. And uh, like you said in your intro, just coming off of Fabulous week in New York City, uh, guest hosting for Wendy Williams with my good friend Kim Whitley. Um, and my sorrow. We were terrified for maybe two minutes. And then we act like we've been on that show and have been working together for almost two years. And that was the it. feedback we got. So we were excited to do that. And uh, my baby got to fly out and be there because on Monday I didn't have my wedding ring on. So she was in the crowd on Tuesday. And... Uh, <laughs> But other than that, so many great things have been happening. And like you just said, Gene, from stand-up comedy to now being the president of one of the biggest chains and the most popular, most loved, most well-respected comedy brands in stand-up, uh, The Laugh Factor. God has really been good. When Lisa, my producer, Lisa E., ha she sent me the email and I'm reading through the stuff, I was like, 
he's the president. What? <laughs> Tell me about everything. Because it's like finesse. You know, it's funny. We were talking right before we started recording about how when you stay in touch with people on, on social media and you don't see them, because I didn't get to see you the last time you were in town because I was headed out of town myself, um, that you forget to check in. And it's like, I was like, what did this happen? I didn't even know you wanted to be um, an executive and, and kind of running stuff. How did this happen? And like, where are you taking it? Well, uh, when I was younger, I always wanted to own my comedy club. Uh, and I got, I got really close. I had an investor and everything. And I was doing stand-up at the time. In fact, I believe, yeah, I was uh, fresh off of Saturday Night Live. And so I wanted to own my own comedy club, got my investor, everything fell through. But um, I moved back out to L.A. after New York, after a stint in uh, South Florida. Um, and I moved back out to L.A., ended up getting the uh, Disney Channel job and became China's dad on a show called Ant Farm. And that ran for four years. And um, it, it, it escaped me. I got back into acting. And the, and the problem that's always been with me is jack of all trades syndrome. You know what I mean? Like I can, I've always felt like I can do anything. Uh, I can, comedy was the escape from me trying to do everything. And comedy ended up taking off and turned into Saturday Night Live and everything else. So it was like, how do I become the business exec and the real estate mogul and the and the and the strip club owner? Like I got goals, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what though, finesse? I think I, we, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but mm -hmm. I want to dive deeper into that because that happens to me too. Whenever you're one of those people who acts and you know because it's like for me is radio tv voiceover now podcasting and speaking and stuff like that people are like could you pick something no why would i why would i ever want to pick any one thing my brain just doesn't work like that right. and i think so many times people tell you what you should be doing and if you get known for one thing, mm -hmm. then people mm -hmm. are like, why are you branching off to this other stuff? Be like, boo, that's where I started. I'm just getting back to yeah. it. How do you manage that when other people have expectations of what you should be doing and, and balancing that with what your heart says and what you know you're good at? Because you are good, you know, at a lot of different things. I think you have to, you have to, Gene, people are different. People are wired different. And as soon as you realize that you're not like your brother or your sister, I mean, it, it, the connection can be that close, even though you came out the same womb. Uh, you're not like your roommate in college. You're not like your fraternity brother or sorority sister. Once you realize that you're different and you have different uh, capabilities and you're firing on different spark plugs or maybe you have more once you accept that then you have to be strong enough and bold enough to stop listening to the people who cannot operate on that frequency they don't even understand the language you're talking and so sometimes when I talk to Tiffany Haddish and she's doing movies and TV and producing other comedians and doing specials and then you sit down and she's talking about a restaurant or something that's uh you know plant-based because she bought land and then her dispensary and you're like wait a minute tell me more about the dispensary but it, it lets me realize when you sit there and you talk to tiffany haddish and she's talking about bitcoin you realize wait a minute this woman is doing it all and she has her hand in everything and she will not allow anyone to tell her she can't be doing so, this and that. That's not how she's wired. And so I had to accept that for myself and realize, oh, wait a minute. I am. I'm, my talent lies in so many different, you know, uh, a part of this big pie chart where sometimes, Gene, we get in our own way. We don't give enough stuff the attention it deserves because we're all ready, ready to move on to get this other thing going. And then we drop the ball on our baby. Then we got to come back and pick that up. And so I think what I've started doing is taking something a little bit further along, really close to the finish line before I start something else to get that to the finish line. 
Then right after the pandemic, all my stuff was at the finish line. So then I just started pushing it over. And now, you know, I'm coming into 2022 and people are like, wait a minute, you're going to be guest hosting for Wendy? I said, yes. But I thought you had a TV show on Fox. Deal hasn't been finalized yet, but yes. But didn't you sell, didn't you sell a movie idea? Yes. Wait a minute, you president of the Laugh Factory? Yes. I and I it. just realized that, you know what? It's nothing but God, but it does take a lot of planning and compartmentalizing and, and allowing yourself to not feel guilty for being successful at everything you put hard work in. Right. This is I my think first day. This is my first day of work. <laughs> I love it. How does, okay, so how does it feel to be... Um, let's talk about this one particular lane. How does it feel to be sitting in, in, in the driver's seat at the Laugh Factory? And what, what do you want to do as, especially as a comic mm -hmm. who's coming in to run a club? That is a very different kind of vibe that that brings. Not that the other vibe is any, is worse or anything like that, but bringing that vibe Mm -hmm. uh, of having been on the stage and tried to get people laughing and be successful and being brought in to bring, you know, get butts in the seats. Right. How does it feel? And what is it that you want to do differently that you always wish another um, comedy club runner had done? Uh, first and foremost, I have never tried to make people laugh. I do that. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I do that. <laughs> yes, you do. And then, um, but what I'm excited about now is that the owner of the Laugh Factory, Jamie Masada, uh, he's like my comedy godfather. And in LA, he's a lot of people's comedy godfather. And A, I cannot wait to, sh to share Jamie with the world. So, my first and foremost thing that I want to do outside of uh, filling out my W-2, making sure I get my paycheck, is sharing with the public who Jamie Masada is. Talking to the public about how he has been putting on a comedy camp for at-risk youth for over 25 years. How Tiffany Haddish was in that very camp, and now she's the comedian who she is today. Um, I also, and you mentioned comedy clubs. We have six clubs, uh, San Diego, Las Vegas, Reno, San, uh, you know, of course, Los Angeles, I said Los Angeles, but uh, Long Beach and Vegas. We're about to open up a bunch more. You and know, Chicago. And Chicago and Chicago. I'm like, how you forget Chicago, fam? That's out. But the most exciting thing we're about to do, because we have some talented people that already work here. We're about to utilize their skill set in a way that, you know, I found out my personal assistant is a former pussycat doll. I'm like, wait a minute. What? Wow. <laughs> but she's a but she's not the one that was in the group. She's the one that's did this right. Broadway or whatever. Um, but everybody's so talented here. And so you know, we want to shoot movies. We want to shoot television shows. We want to shoot short form content. Uh, and we want to utilize all the skill sets of a lot of the comedians who cannot get to the right people out here in Hollywood. Well, everybody loves the Laugh Factory. And we know this is a conduit to people moving on to bigger and better things. And so I want to make sure I keep those channels open to all my comedic family and then the people who work for us currently. These people are super talented. So we got to get them moving from point A to point B to point C so they can be the next Spike Lee or the next Ava DuVernay. You know, I forgot all about this. You get off the plane or the train or you get out of your car, you make that cross-country drive, whatever. To go. You just want to be in show business. So if you get a job at the Laugh Factory, you'll take doorman. But you'll never know the doorman is one of the biggest producers and directors and he has that or she has that in them and it's untapped because nobody asks. They just wanted a job to keep them afloat while they try to figure out or rub elbows with the right people. Well, 
I'm that right person because I want to get these people in front of the right people. And so that's my goal. That's my goal I here at the lab. That. Expand the I brand and make it just not about the comedy clubs. Make it uh, hitting on all cylinders like I do when it comes to all my projects. I love that. And you know, and it's an inter- and it's a good extension of what Jamie started. Like I I got I've had the pleasure of interviewing Jamie before and talking to him. And he <laughs> is and he is a firecracker because he and George Wallace are such good friends. So that's how I met him. And yeah. when he opened in Chicago, you know, we talked and everything. And the thing that I love about the old school way of, of comedy in the clubs is that the folks who own the clubs were the ones like looking for talent, developing talent and giving it a place to grow. And now you, it sounds like you're taking that into, into this new way of doing that because there is talent everywhere and it ha- everybody hasn't always gotten the chance to get there. What is the piece of advice that you got that helped you the most, the best advice you got when you were exploring all these different things that make up your performing career? What? I'll never forget it. Like they said it to me yesterday. Chris Rock's brother, Tony Rock, phenomenal comedian. We're all sitting in the diner one day with another comedian, Butch Bradley. And he said, you want to make it in L.A.? Don't leave. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. But then it hit me. You know, people that you see going strong for three years, all of a sudden they disappear. And you're like, hey, whatever happened to so-and-so? Oh, they had to move back to, you know, so-and-so. They have to move back to blah, blah, blah. So that type of advice was perfect for me back then. Because believe it or not, it was the same advice I got at the University of Miami when I was like, I'm about to quit. I'm about to go back to Atlanta. Somebody said, well, if you want to graduate, can't leave. You got to stay. You got to figure it out. And so uh, just hearing that at that time was everything that I needed. So we all have, I mean, I know I have my sleeping on couches story. What's so funny is that, you know, I literally slept on one of my boys' couch for over two years. And we never really kind of like, Talked, uh, talked about it in, 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 in the way of time, like how long I was on the couch. It was over two years. Roommates who actually had rooms in the house came and went, and I stayed on this man's couch. And, and, and anytime a new person came in, he'd be like, oh, that's finesse. He live on the couch. And I'd be like, hey. And then and they'd be like, that's the TV room. Like, yeah, well, he not, you know, he leave at night, but he come back and he'd live on. But I say all that to say that that type of stuff and those type of stories make me realize that, A, you can't give up, you can't leave, of course, but when you get a little bit of momentum and traction, you're going to hit a wall. You're going to hit a lull. You got to stay just as excited as when you got that first momentum because it comes in waves. I've been out here off and on since 99. And now I realize that people don't have to leave their home. I knew I had to come out here to be discovered. But now people will discover you through your telephone. So you stay dedicated to your telephone and creating content. Somebody going to find you. And that's how half of the kids get on uh, wild. I say kids. Half of the people get on wild and out. (laughs) Because they built up their fan base. And Nick Cannon does the very thing that I want to do with the Laugh Factory. He goes and he grabs those dedicated, committed people and he puts them on television. And he's been able to keep that show going for 16 years. Well, Laugh Factory's been around for a very long time and I plan to take it into the next, the next generation where people are like, holy crap. But I gotta make sure they know who Jamie Masada is first because he's a legend, he's an icon and he gave me probably one of the best opportunities of my lifetime. He trusted me with the brand. So I'm very excited about that. I love it. And you know what? There's a lot in those two words, don't leave. Because yeah, don't leave means something different now. But Mm -hmm. it's about that commitment. It's about, Mm -hmm. and it's also about knowing that you have something. It it even goes back to what you start, what we started with when it comes to knowing that you're different and, and accepting that, welcoming it, and then not leaving yourself because other people will. Like one of the things about you, and I don't know how, how you feel about this, but 
I like I feel like you are one of those talents. Even though you stay working, you stay with a job. People people in the business know you who you are. But I feel like your star still hasn't risen to the level that you have the potential to. Um, that like you kind of that like if you know finesse, then you know, especially in that larger Hollywood circle. How, do you is that an unfair assessment? Um, that's, that's bullseye. Bullseye. And here's the thing. Everybody out here knows it. They're like, it's almost like, oh, finesse, when you pop, pop, like when you blow, blow, because exactly how you said it. And you know how your frat brothers are, like you said, I'm a new. Yeah. I always get these DMs. Bro, you stay with a check. Man, you stay with a bag. Like you, it's true. I'm going to find a job. But I haven't found, and I have a career, but I haven't found that thing that people leave my comedy show with. And it's the same question. You should be, you should be, a you should be like, because they go to comedy shows and yeah, you laugh, but a Finesse Mitchell show it, it comes out of nowhere. If, you, if you're a fan of comedy, but it's your first time seeing me, then you're like, holy shit. Well, how come these people are big and you're not big, big? You know, how come you're not lying isn't all the way around the corner and you adding shows? Well, I got to fix that. That's on me. I can't blame anybody but me. But a lot of it in this business, Gene, is luck. And I hate to say it like that. But, you know, once you're prepared, and once you're ready to go, you can't stop that big time manager, producer, or director from getting out of his bed. You, 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 you can't control that. To happen to be in the club that day to say, oh my God, I wanna take your career to the next level. Because there are people out here in our business that can really take your career and just make it soar. You know, they have all the connections. They've been out here for a long time. And it's just like a plug in it. You plug in a new, a new horse. I tell comedians all the time, we're all funny, but it's a horse race. And nobody wins. It's the jockey. It's the jockey sitting on top of you. That's, that's. You're going to make me fight you today. That's the <laughs> truth. That, and that's the truth. I think, mm -hmm. I think that that's a lesson that we could all learn no matter what we are. I mean, we're talking as performers because I think that's just as true for uh, careers like mine in broadcast or whatever. There's only so many of us that are mm -hmm. going to get a talk show like Wendy or a talk show like Tamron or, um, or be like the anchor. There's only so many of those jobs. There's, you know, how many slots on the pistons, like J. Cole says, like, you know, everybody want to be Pippin, but... <laughs> Well, right. you know, and so, but, and the thing is, is that some of that has to do with that don't leave commitment. Some of that has to do with recognizing where you are and being good with it. What do you think your biggest disappointment or setback has been? And how did you stay committed through that to push through? Because you talked about the lulls and I 100% agree. Like, it's like you get a gig and you up here. And then even if you come down here, you like, I'm still doing good, but I'm not up here anymore. And so right. how do you live? And then sometimes you like, ain't nobody calling me. Ain't nobody right. talking to me. I'm never going to work again. How do you manage those ups and downs? Uh, you have to be passionate about something outside of your career. And I don't care if it's bowling. I don't care if you're in a bowling league, but you have to have something that you're equally excited about so that you can focus on that and just be normal because you can do the hustle for forever, but you never know when you're winning because you never stop to smell your own roses. You get one job and want the bigger job. You get one paycheck and want a bigger paycheck. You buy one house, and then within six months, the house is too small. You have to stop and say, it's okay to be right here for right now and enjoy this. That helps your mental. More people, Gene, in our business commit suicide, especially in stand-up, not to take it to a dark place, 
But social media helps with that because we get to see our friends and peers and everybody else who we think are deserving and the ones who are not living their best life. But everybody's posting their best moments. And ain't nobody posting domestic violence. Ain't nobody posting you didn't pay your bill. Ain't nobody posting that you couldn't, you lost your wallet. You know what I mean? Nobody posts the stupid stuff, the bad stuff, the normal stuff. We're all posting wins. And a lot of that stuff is fake. The car isn't yours. The, the, the clothes were borrowed. But people who are still struggling and grinding, they see that life and then they get down on themselves. To your question, my biggest thing that I had to overcome as far as the disappointment, I had to forgive myself for not giving Saturday Night Live my all. I had to one day wake up and say, you know what? I I did fuck off a lot of time. I didn't do my best. I didn't try to do my best. Really? But did I party every night? (laughs) Was I in the streets? Was, did I have a girl? Did I, did I, I lived. That was like the best time of my life I lived and actually doing the show was a blur. I don't even remember the show more so than I remember myself being in the clubs and meeting people who were super famous. We were bubbling back then. Ashton Kutcher, Timberlake had just went solo. Lindsay Lohan still wasn't old enough to get in the club. She was getting me in the clubs. You know, it was just like Maxwell, Tom Brady. I mean, I can name names from every aspect of life. Scarlett Johansson. Shit, Halle Berry, like everybody, uh, what's his Jack Black? Everybody had a big moment that got them on Saturday Night Live as a host. And we just happened to be there because we were already on the show. Well, it's 15 years later. A lot of these people are mega stars now. You know what I mean? And I look back on that moment and I said, oh man. You know, I didn't work as hard as Jason Sudeikis and Seth Meyers and Jimmy Fallon and Amy Poehler. I had to own that. And once I got that out of my head and I stopped living in yesterday, I was able to like, okay, well, what do I want to do? I like hosting stuff. Maybe I'll be a talk show host. Wait a minute. I like just talking crap on the microphone. I'll start my own podcast. I, you know. I was watching the Joe Rogans, probably not a good example right now, but I was watching the Joe Rogans. <laughs> I, was, I was watching these people do this stuff and I was like, ah, that's stupid. But now they make up they making these mega million dollar deals because that's a new lane. It's an old lane, but now it's still but it's still a new lane. And so that's one thing I had to do. I had to forgive myself for wasting a lot of time. Mm. And I'm not wasting time no more. I'm, I'm I'm so ready, ready. And this is another thing that helps me too. The Bernie Macs and the Steve Harveys and the Morgan Freemans, they were older than me. They were older than I am right now when they started to take off, take off. And because I look, you know what I'm saying? Because I still look 39-ish. Oh man, I got a... I, I'm in good health, thank God, but I got a lot to do and a long way, a long way to go. And I do not feel like I've even s- scratched the surface of everything I'm about to do, especially in this business. I love it. What What are some things you haven't accomplished or even tried yet that you want to? What else is on the list? Because um, I actually, I think I love you as a host, maybe because I we you know used to come and guest host on the show that we were on when you were in town. We had such chemistry, so Perfect. much fun. It was so much fun, and you know, I was like, if you don't get rid of this white lady and insert me in, <laughs> can they put two black people in on the morning? <laughs> one of these days they might, child. One of these days they might. But one of the things I love though. Because it's so many, a lot of people don't realize, and Melissa used to say this, speaking of the white lady, Melissa used to say this. She was like, you know, we got to stop making shit look easy because when you make stuff look easy, people actually think it is easy to do. And one of the hardest Mm -hmm. things to do is to come into a show that's already done and be a guest host. And, And that's one of the things that I think is so amazing about your talent is that it's so flexible. Like, I love your podcast. Um, and, and that reflects that, but I also like the way, you know, you rocking things on Wendy and the way we did it together and, and things like that. And 
it, what is it what, of that whole list of things that you find interesting and that you're good at? What, what else is on the list that you haven't even tried yet or that you want to really pop big with? You know, I really want to lead my own sitcom. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a movie star, but I really just want to be a television star. I want to show up to work at a certain time and I want to be back on the road going home at a certain time. And a multi-cam sitcom allows you to do, do that. So the Martins and the Fresh Prince of Bel Airs and the, you know, I'm going to say it anyway, the Cosby Show, like those, those shows changed the culture. You know what I mean? And I feel like I can be a new dad, a new version of a new dad, doing the same material, but doing it Finesse's way. Because even when I did Wendy, I said, I'm not Wendy. Because I'll never forget the, 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 the executive executive was like, now remember, it's not a comedy show. You can be serious. You can be informational. You can be whatever. And he said, so just keep that in mind. I said, okay, cool. I'm going to be finessed because I never know what I'm going to say, but I know what not to say. And that's my power. I know how to walk that line and I know what not to say. So that when I do say something serious, it hits you. You're like, ah, he snuck a gem in there. You know, that's I, what I felt about I was your on relationship. Wendy and she was interviewing me. I, w I was a guest on Wendy and she was interviewing me. And I said, part of your, I said, it came out of nowhere. But I said part of the job description and part of your talent is how well you work with others. And it has nothing to do with what you can actually do. It's how well you work with others. Yes. And the whole crowd was like, hmm. Because that's how you get invited back, you know? Um, Kim Whitley is Sherry Shepherds. They, 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 that's two peas in a the pod. They're the same woman. They, they, you know, that, that's Batman and Robin. They, that's, that's Batman and Batman. You know what I mean? <laughs> but she was like, finesse, the chemistry. I said, well, I know what your strengths are. I know what your insecurities and weaknesses are. And we just going to play to those strengths and have fun. And it, it comes with listening and observing and you know what I mean? And we just had so much fun. When I sat down with you, I'll never forget this time we were interviewing Lou Ferrigno and I had said something about, so when you having sex with your lady, do you turn green and your face was like, I mean, just, and you, do <laughs> <laughs> you go, <laughs> It was hilarious. I thought I was going to pee on myself. That's what that look was. I was like, "Hey, I can't believe you did it, but B, I'm glad you did." And he and he couldn't answer. He was laughing so hard. Yeah, I think um, I just think uh, you cannot hate on anybody if you're too busy laughing. Yeah. And one thing I knew, I know, I know to this day, Wendy's crowd misses Wendy. Wendy's crowd wants Wendy. All this guest hosting is cool. They want Wendy. So you have to figure out who you want to host and take her place if she doesn't come back. But you not keep continuing to call it the Wendy Williams show. She's never going to come back. I she, hope she does they, she they, come back. I hope, she does. I hope she does too. But honestly, real talk, they have to give her all the time she needs to get well. But I also think that, uh, and it'll make a great story if she does come back, because everybody's going to want to know what happened, where you've been, how you feel. But I, I'm praying for her, and she was super kind always to me. And the Wendy that I know wasn't always, didn't have a reputation of always being kind to people. She would find that thing to poke, but she never did that with me. And had plenty of opportunities. And so I wish her the best and I want her to recover and, and be in the right frame of mind because her fan base misses her. And I realized how talented she was sitting in her chair. She has no notes. It's all up here. She can thumb through a magazine, Jean, and do the whole hot topics by herself. And she's so engaging 
that you watch, you tune in to watch, whether she's going to talk about somebody, whether it's true or not, who knows? But you, you are captivated, and that's a talent, you know? Yep. So, well, And, you know, one of the things about you, and this is what made me think about when you talk about that, that, that flexibility um, and the ability to laugh and the ability to uh, also be serious, your relationship advice, like I would love if you want to do it, if you ever decide to do a talk show, I think at least a portion of it has to be like based on that concept from your book and and from the uh, the the column, because like you told some gems in there that people needed to hear in a way that people could accept it, because I think a lot of times. Right. Women, women, especially, right. we don't always take advice the way we want, the way it's given or any, maybe anybody, right. maybe nobody does. But you, I think that's how you've been able to drop those truth bombs on people without hurting their feelings and right. and doing that. And that's that's a balancing act. Like, how did you even get into giving people relationship advice, Finesse? Because this is before Dries. This was before Dries. I don't even know. Well, it started with uh, it started with Essence magazine doing the column for them, but it was supposed to be an ensemble column. It was supposed to be, hey, we're going to use finesse from SNL, Tyrese, Genuine, Jason Seahorn, like all these people from the like early two thousands, mid two thousands. We're going to um, use these people to give the, the ladies of Essence relationship advice. And when they read my answers, they were just like, "We got to meet this nut." This, this dude is a nut. I want to meet him. Because this is true, but I laugh the entire time. And I just see things differently. I try to see things honestly. But I can't help but make it come out comedically. And I'd rather hear the truth. But it also makes light of it at the same time. And then let me think about it on the way home. And that's how I try to approach relationship advice. It's a, it's, there's a pinch there, but you're smiling and laughing because I told you something and you're just thinking to yourself, but then later on, you really think about it and you really process it. But that's a good joke though, if it's got that pinch. Like it's not a good joke unless it has that, that grain of truth that messes you up. Perfect example. I got a friend, April Watts. I, I forgot what market she's in, but she's a radio personality. And I, but I know she's in the Midwest. And she's always on Instagram, you know, talking to the ladies and da 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 da. And she said, "Ladies, we need a man like this." And the video was of his brother in his pajamas cleaning up his apartment. I mean, he's vacuuming, he's he's polishing, and you know, he's lifting up furniture with one arm and getting all up under this and that. And the caption was, "You know, get you a man who's gonna clean and pay a lot of attention to his apartment." like that because he's like he likes detail da, 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 da. and then i said i left it in the comments or his main lady about to come back in town and he just tried to get rid of her. and she said i hate you for i hate you finesse mitchell it's the truth finesse mitchell it is the truth honey it you is know. the absolute truth who, who cleaning under the couch? Ain't nobody looking under the couch. He was but, showing off. Yeah, basically. And trying to find some drawers that was left behind. But you know what, though? Hey, you he ain't heard like, it from me. When you, when, you, when you do pay attention to detail like that. I used to be like that, Gene. I used to be that person. Like, I, I'm not saying, I used to have people in my car. And when they leave, I'm looking at my seat. Because girls love to do this. They just love to pull stuff, pull their hair. And whatever they have in their pocket, it's always a chapstick in the seat or on the passenger side. That, you got to look at all that stuff. But that was back in the day day. Now I'm saved. I don't have to worry about it. Put your little halo on top of your head. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I got two last questions for you. The first one is, what is the thing that you are the most proud of at this point in your life? Of all the things, amazing experiences that you've had, what are you most proud of accomplishing? Two things. Elle and Eva. Uh, my oldest is named Elle Boogie. My, my youngest is named Eva the Diva. I gave them two nicknames. Now they call Snoop and Snitch. 
because that's the oldest will snoop through your stuff and the youngest is telling everything like i ain't never met a baby that just snitching is in her dna i'm like your daddy's not a snitch why are you a snitch but uh looking at those girls faces and realizing that i don't ever 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 want to share them uh with another man who's now dating my wife because i was a knucklehead that's my biggest accomplishment and motivation to provide for all of my girls and to do right by all of my girls because uh i don't know they i don't know it's bigger than comedy it's bigger than success but the success that i'm having in comedy is allowing me to enjoy them and take my foot off the gas and hustle in a different capacity. You know, it's I've not been a seeing that. hustle anymore. It's a, it's a family yeah. hustle. Even yeah. what I post, it's a family hustle. Okay, come on, come on, Gene. Guess who's my <laughs> vice president at the Laugh Factory? It better be a dream. You gotta, you come gotta on. say it. Cause Come she on. is brilliant. Like literally tell your wife, I said, hello. And I love her. Cause one of the things that I loved when you came in town and cause it's like, you know, I've seen a lot with my, my comic friends and I don't judge anybody. Cause, cause we all got to live and get to where we going. Right. Mm -hmm. But I remember when you came for the TV show and every now and then Adrice would come with you and it was clear that you guys were partners, not just, you out here and she's, you know, your support at home. She was also your support at work and helping. And I don't know what y'all were going through then or what you were going through then personally at that point, because I hadn't gotten to know you yet. But what I could tell was that a big part of your success was that sister right there. So I'm going to just say that I'm so glad that you would acknowledge that. And that you're living that because mm -hmm. the fruits of those labors are things that you see. And it's hard for us when we're performers to admit that we need somebody to be able to do that. Right. Uh, her mom, her mom, she said something really touching. She said, uh, she said, I love how you two move in one accord. And I said, uh, Thank you. She said, do you know what that means? I said, no, but thank you. I, I, I you know, I'm guessing, you know, I mean, my but, daddy, my daddy used to call it being equally yoked. See, like, that I know that she, see, that's one of the few quotes of the Bible. I know that's because your ass is country. <laughs> like people be forgetting you from Atlanta. Like you like, oh, I'm from Atlanta. Atlanta wasn't that big of a city when we, when that's we were right. the same age. Oh, that's all I'm going to say. We are equally yoked. My, a, I think my wife is brilliant. She she pays attention to detail. And I hear comedians say all the time, uh, you know, I love to see your wife in the balcony taking notes. You can tell she has a recorder on. She's taking notes and da 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 da. And we discussed the set on the way home. You know, she loves hearing new jokes. She loves, because I leave the house at night. I leave the house at night and then I come to the comedy clubs. Well, the next time she sees me live, I better have some new jokes because I'm always leaving at night. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I, I know what she's doing. You know what I mean? But um, yes, so she's super smart. Uh, she comes from a very corporate background. I come from a very hands-on entertainer background. Together, we're one solid executive. And I wouldn't even consider the position if she didn't want to do it with me because... She knows the stuff I don't know. Like, orientation, I was like, who got vaxxed? She was like, you can't ask that in no meeting? Like, that's personal. I said, well, I need to know. So, <laughs> together, <laughs> together, uh, it'll all get done. But, I um, love it. Oh. She's super excited. She's super excited. She, she, she used to work with Tracy Edmonds mm -hmm. and uh, Our Stories and Edmonds Entertainment. And that movie, Who's Your Caddy? That's when I first met her. And um, we joke about that all the time and how far we've come since then. And uh, she did not want to do this job. I had so-called retired her. And uh, she really enjoyed just being with the girls. But um, Jamie Masada is such a great friend. And I wouldn't have the career I had if it wasn't for him. 
and he has young children and he wants to spend time with his kids, but he also wanted to, uh, he just wanted to, to, to feel like somebody understood, somebody who's taken over understands exactly what he wants and, 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 and what he was thinking 20 something years ago. And, and, I can, and I feel like I can carry out that vision. And you we have absolutely a, can. We have, we have great people and, and we're going we're gonna to do some big things. I'm excited. I'm excited for you too. I can't wait to see what's next. All right, here's my last question. It's a question I ask everybody to close with. Okay. When, when do you feel like you are your best, truest, most authentic expression of yourself? What are you doing? How are you feeling? What, what, what is it that makes you feel that way? Well, I discovered that sativa works way better than indica. I'm a sativa type dude, G. Like, indica make me sleepy. It made me drowsy, it made me grumpy. Put bags under my eyes. Let's see that. But the other, the other pick me up. I kind of pick you up. You know, and uh, I realize that when I'm not on the mic, uh, I'm my most truest and authentic self when I'm just relaxing. I think of so many funny, brilliant things to do and ideas, and it's not my lane. And I had to, some, I have to, some, I just put them in my phone, but I leave it alone. I try to give social media a break, put that down. And that's why I don't post as much as I used to. And when I do post, I'm trying to post my kids or now I'm reposting other people's videos because I found out that's way easier than coming up with my own content. Let me go find these popular videos and post their stuff and act like I did it. You know what I mean? So, you know, I'm just trying to make my life easier because I find that I'm my best self when I'm not stressed. And creative, creative, driven people stress the hell out of themselves. And we allow other people to stress us out because they don't understand our stress. So we have to, I, I learned to give myself a break. And when it's time to stop working, stop working. You know, time for a glass of wine, time for a glass of wine. I don't even drink anymore. That's another good thing. I, it's going on two years now that I haven't had a drink. So, um, but when I say that, uh, OG, OG, triple OG, Kush, that, uh, yeah. That Ooga Booga. What? That Ooga Wee. That Ooga Wee. That Boogity Boogity. <laughs> Finesse Mitchell, I love you to life. Thank you so much for today. I appreciate it. This was amazing. You are <laughs> You are and you always will be one of my best and favorite people to talk to. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for having me. All right. You know, I love how my guests add things to fearless authenticity and also give me something to think about. And finesse was no exception. Um, every time I talk to finesse, he's become a good friend because there are a lot of things we have in common about how we've experienced our careers and how we look at them. Um, but he really got to the essence of fearless authenticity when he said people are different. And once you realize you're different and accept it, then being strong enough and bold enough to stop listening to people who don't operate on your frequency because they can't even understand what you're talking about. So many times we just want to be understood and we just want to be, you know, um, like everybody else in a certain way, not realizing that the gift of each and every one of us is that we are all different and we all have something to offer that's special and that's where our success lives. But we sometimes water it down because we listen to other people who don't quite get it. Um, Another thing, because uh, this is something both of us have done so many different things in our careers. I love to hear him say this because this has been a struggle of mine as an entrepreneur that what he started doing is taking things a little bit further, closer to their end before he starts something else so he can get more things to the finish line because it really is about finishing things. We can start so many different things, but we kind of leave them half done and then the full vision is never realized and that maybe that was the thing we were really supposed to be doing amongst other things. Um, another piece, not giving up, not leaving course when we start things. And for me, this is really connected to that finishing part is that sometimes when we get, 
you know, setbacks or we lose momentum or lose traction when we hit the wall and hit that low, it's hard to get the momentum to go back up. And you've got to stay excited when you get to those low points as you were when you were at the height of your momentum, because it comes in waves, just like everything else. Um, Here's a great piece of advice I love, being passionate about something outside of your career. I got a bad habit of turning my um, my ho hobbies into money-making ventures and I ruin all of them <laughs> like that. But it's your moment having those hobbies and that those things that you're achieving that you can focus on it, be normal, and there's no outcome to it other than you just accomplishing something for yourself because you really could hustle forever and hustling forever kills yourself. You know, It really just puts you in a position where you're always on a grind. You're always on that hamster wheel, just trying to go, 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 go. And you have to stop and say that it's okay to be right here, right now. That was the words that Finesse used there. And when he said, driven people stress the hell out of themselves. Man, if that ain't the truth, we will fight ourselves on everything and say we're not doing enough when it is, as my dad would say, good enough. Um, and then forgiving yourself for wasting time, um, you know, not taking advantage of the things that you should have uh, and beating yourself up and letting it go and admitting the part that you played in that and the inspiration that he gets from people like Bernie Mac and Steve Harvey, who were instrumental in my early career too, who started later, you know, um, and when they are, and they, and they were, they started taking off later in their careers too. They were at it for a very long time and then really started and then maximized it. So just cause you're not on track with what everybody else is doing or where you think you're behind because you're a certain age and you haven't done this, this, and this, you focused on the wrong thing. So finesse, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being my friend and my guest today. I also have a lot of other thank yous to you, our listeners, for your support, to my team uh, doing all the production work to make this podcast happen. And of course, we want you to be a part of the community. So follow me at JM Sparrow on Twitter and on Instagram at Ms. Jean Sparrow at uh, Facebook and on TikTok. Please like, rate, review, uh, follow, subscribe to the pod on the iHeart app, Apple, or wherever you get your podcast. The video version is also on YouTube. And uh, also send us your comments, questions, anything you want to know about fearless authenticity or somebody you want me to talk about. If you've got some ideas, shoot them my way. This has been Fearless Authenticity with Gene Sparrow. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you soon.